I can see what such a beautiful place it is and why she wanted to be here. It's really, really good to be here where it happened by the waters and, and I can't wait just to spend some time on the beach where she was last seen. She went missing in 2021. In the midst of a world locked down with travel being severely limited, her parents couldn't even go to the site where she was last seen. That footage is from a year later when they finally got there, and you can see the pain on both of their faces. What has them now reaching out to the President of the United States, asking for help? It's time to turn on the searchlight for Sarm Heslop. Welcome back to Brain Scratch Searchlight. I'm John Lorden. Thank you so much for joining me here today and for caring about these cases like I do. It was one of you, a supporter of this channel that reached out to me and said, John, there's a case that we have out here. Families from the UK, the person goes missing in the US Virgin Islands and someone that is considered a person of interest is now in the US. Uh, Miss ESL, thank you so much for reaching out and telling me about this case. And I understand why it's important to raise exposure to this case really all around the world. And initially when this case happened in 2021, it looked like that was happening. The news cycles were very strong, um, international publications all talking about this case. You get to 2022, things thinned out considerably. And honestly, this year it's been barely a blip. We want to help re-raise exposure to this case. So we're talking about it here today. And I can't thank you enough for coming along into this with us. So let's go ahead and start by learning where this is taking place. And this is a little different than the usual start of our cases um, because she goes missing from a boat. Where is that boat? As I mentioned, the U.S. Virgin Islands here at Britannica.com. We're going to learn a little bit about the USVI. Uh, the United States Virgin Islands are an organized, unincorporated island territory of the United States, situated at the eastern end of the Greater Antilles, about 40 miles east of Puerto Rico. Um, and I was curious about that. Of course, whenever you're talking about cases of this nature, um, people that go missing from a boat, there is a big question of, especially if there's foul play being considered, um, I think there's this old theory that all of us had about international waters and there being no laws that really govern there. Um, that's not true. There's basically a, a, an agreement and a set order of things that kind of guide which country is going to take ownership of those issues. Um, but for this story, we're not in international waters, which I believe is 24 miles away from the shoreline. This is basically happening right on a coast like we're talking uh, maybe a few hundred feet away from shore uh, let's continue and learn just a little bit more about this area the territory is composed of three large islands saint croix saint john and saint thomas saint john will be the one that we're focusing on here today uh, in terms of their economy they've got one big thing tourism Based on the pleasant tropical climate, the attractive scenery, good fishing, proximity to the U.S. mainland, and free port status, tourism dominates the economy there. And that's part of why Sarm was there working on this boat. Uh, essentially, she started dating a guy that owns this boat, and he would rent it out for charters, for private charters, um, decided to hire her on as the chef for those charters. And here you can see uh, a big bright smile. Apparently this is uh, just something that she loved to do. She was kind of a traveler at heart. She had done a very long trip across the ocean uh, with some other people that she knew before. Um, for some reason, it's, it's so strange to think that, you know, how dangerous could a trip like that be when you're literally uh, going around the world, but here you are a few hundred feet from the shoreline and you go missing in this way. Here's another picture. And I wanted to show this picture because I can't find a whole lot of great photos with her tattoos. I've got another one, but you can see a little bit of her tattoo here. Her friends have put together a website, findsarm.com, and there they have a very good shot of the tattoo. It looks like it was, this is a picture taken probably just maybe the same day or days after it was done. 
Um, so there's a much better shot of it. So rolling back the clock a little bit, we're starting at mirror.co.uk. This is going back to March of 2021. And really it started hitting the news cycle um, a couple days after the actual event. So she would go missing kind of late Sunday night into Monday morning. That is March 7th leading into March 8th. British woman, 41, missing for four days in Caribbean with divers searching ocean. Sarm Heslop's boyfriend says he has not seen the 41-year-old since before Monday morning when he woke up to find her not on their catamaran. The pair had been sailing on the 47-foot boat Siren Song together before she disappeared off the U.S. Virgin Islands. A source, a police source in St. John said that they were very concerned about her welfare. Quote, an English woman has gone missing on our island and we're appealing for help and trying to locate her. She was last seen on Sunday aboard her boat, which was moored off the coast of St. John. Every day that goes by and we don't have any news about her is a major concern for us. We need to locate her as soon as possible. Heslop is described as having a Southern English accent with a butterfly tattoo on her left shoulder. It's believed her phone, passport, and belongings remain on the yacht. And I know in a lot of cases that we talk about, especially missing persons cases, um, it's almost a regular thing that at some point the family and the friends are going to become um, frustrated with the investigation. It's almost a regular thing that we're asking the question, is law enforcement doing all that they can in this situation? That question certainly going to be in play as, as we go through this. But even in the early coverage um, and knowing that they're talking about a missing persons case, I was kind of amazed at the lack of detail. We're getting no clothing description in these early articles. Uh, her height and her weight, the quote from the police to these media sources of average weight and average height. Like just basically no details. Um, so, and, and that's kind of interesting, right? Cause that would lead me to wonder, well, who are they talking to? Why don't they have those details or who is not giving them that information? Obviously she's in a relationship with this person that she's on the boat with. Would he have some idea about how tall she was about what she waged? I would hope so. And if he's going and talking to local police about her being missing, are they going to ask him? Is he not answering them? Did they not ask? I don't know, but there's some breakdown in communication that's already happening, like right off the top of this case. Quite honestly, um, I had to dig through tons of articles before I even figured out that she was five foot eight and we don't really have a weight on her, but based on what I can see some from pictures of her body type and her being about five foot eight, I'd say she's probably around 115 to 125 pounds, some, somewhere in that range. Um, but I'm just amazed there's, there's none of that information in these, these early articles. Of course, also interesting that her phone passport and her belongings remain on the yacht. In a lot of these cases, we have law enforcement kind of assume, well, the person has the right to go missing if they want to. It's, it's really not reasonable. She's in an area where if she wants to go missing, she's not taking her passport. I mean, maybe you're not taking your phone cause you don't want to be traced, but like your passport, you're going to have to move into another country at some point, unless you're staying on this cluster of islands, which I guess is a possibility, but uh, obviously things very important to her being left behind on the yacht. The former air hostess had traveled or arrived in the Caribbean after sailing across the Atlantic and had remained in the area due to COVID. Um, I think it was a little more than that, but you know, these, these are the early articles from accounts given by her friends, like, she was basically falling in love. I think she had been with this guy for about eight months at this point. And there was even a period of time where she went and did another job for a little while just to, to make some more money, kind of get her savings banked up a little more. Uh, and that's when he kind of came up with the proposal about you could work as the chef here and, you know, we could, we could do rentals. And then she decided to fly back to be with him. So that's at least that's kind of the account that we're getting from people close to her. Um, let's check this out on a map. It, it's interesting because, you know, this isn't the type of case where really looking at maps is going to be super, super helpful, but, um, I don't know about people that might be traveling to this area. Uh, maybe you're someone that has been out there at some point and this can help you in terms of understanding, but basically we're looking at the U S Virgin islands and we are looking for a particular port there. So this is St. John and then 
this big one is called Cruise Bay, but there's actually kind of a, another small area within that um, that is known as Frank's Bay, uh, which I'm just going to go ahead and run the search so it'll actually mark it because I don't think the name, there it is. You have to zoom in really far to get the name, apparently. Um, so we're looking at the western edge, kind of the far jutting western edge of St. John there. Sarm Heslop, 41, was last seen on board the 47-foot siren song in the U.S. Virgin Islands last Sunday. Again, that would be March 7th, 2021. And her boyfriend told cops she might have fallen overboard in the night. I'm curious about that. Um, I really wish that we had some direct quotes on, on that because the way that this boat is structured, um, this isn't like a cruise ship. Like, you know, falling over the edge of a cruise ship it's, it's a big giant object. Uh, there's a bit of height that's involved with that. It's not like you're going to swim back to the edge of the cruise ship and always have a way back up it. You might have to look for particular entry points um, that are helpful in terms of you getting back up. For this type of boat, it's a catamaran. Like everything is super, super low. And as a matter of fact, the rear end of it has basically steps built into it. Um, so you know, falling over the edge here, look at the height of these people. I, I don't know who this lady is. There's a possibility this might even be her. I'm not sure. Um, but if they fall off the edge of this boat here, it's maybe six, seven feet until you're in the water. So what type of injury could happen in that type of fall? I suppose if you fell the right way, maybe you could have knocked your head on the corner as you were going over the railing or something like that. There, There's always potential for, for some type of injury like that. But if you are essentially conscious when you're in the water, there's no immediate risk outside of, oh, I have to get to a spot where I can get back up into this boat. And being someone that works on this boat, I think you realize where that spot is. Like they do all kinds of, they have water toys that they, you know, let people that are renting this boat use. They know that all that stuff is coming off the back. So all she would have to do, even if she did fall in, in the middle of the night, is get to the back of the boat or uh, it's kind of hard to make out from this picture, but this boat also tows a dinghy. It basically has a little tiny boat that it's towing around with it. And that's just like, like if you've ever seen a rubber dinghy, like that's basically what it is. So all you would have to do at a minimum, like even if you didn't want to get back up into the boat, let's say that there was an argument going on and you don't want to confront that person again, you could just get in the dinghy. And you don't even need steps for that. You swim up to the side of it, you lift a leg over and you're in. So I'm curious about um, this initial story that we're hearing and why would the assumption be she might have fallen overboard? I mean, I, I guess if you wake up in the middle of the night, you don't know where the other person on the boat is and you go and you see that the dinghy's still there. Yeah, I, I guess it's a fair assumption, but there's also other boats that are in this area um, I think even though it's only 150 feet to the shoreline, based on what I'm reading, it's not the type of thing where you would swim to the shore. Uh, the shore is kind of rocky. Tides can be a little tricky in this area. There is, there is a possibility if there was some type of accident that uh, a, basically a riptide could have even kind of pulled her out of that bay, um, which is, is something I want to kind of keep in our mindset as we're looking through this because... I, I think you guys can see where this is going already. There's going to be a lot of eyes looking in one particular direction and the person in that direction not helping himself in the slightest in terms of uh, how he's participating in the search for her. But is there another possible scenario here where there was an accident of some kind? I just want to stay open to that. Uh, is there a possible scenario where someone else could be involved in this in some way? Possibly. Um, the possibility of her leaving of her own accord, um, to run off, start a new life, something like that, which maybe she has a personality for, I don't, I don't know. I haven't heard enough about her to really make that determination, but based on the things she's leaving behind, probably not a factor here. I did hear, uh, or bumped into some comments from friends and family about the possibility that, um, maybe she ended her own life. That doesn't seem like a very strong possibility in this case either. And again, showing that picture of the boat, you know, that, that would certainly not be a, um, a, a surefire way to try to get that done. Like just falling over the end of a boat and six feet later you're in the water. I'm, I'm not even sure how, 
how that would um, go that way. So that one's kind of tough. Really, for me, I'm down to is, you know, are we looking at intimate partner violence? Are we looking at someone else being a part of this in some way? Or are we looking at an accident? And I, I can't really write off those three. Uh, let's see if that changes for you guys as we're going through all this. But the 47-foot siren song boat where the pair were living is estimated to be worth around a half million pounds sterling. The vessel, which her partner owns, is rented out to charter guests who she takes on a tour of the islands for around 5,000 pounds a week. Um, sounds like a pretty good business. And like we mentioned, this tourism is the business in this area. If you're effectively living on the boat and giving tours like this, you're not paying rent. Um, you know, that, that seems like it could be very lucrative. The type of thing where maybe you would do a couple weeks on, a couple weeks off, maybe uh, live a, a little bit more vacation and bring that into your life than a lot of people get to. But a U.S. Coast Guard spokesman said the that Sector San Juan received a call on Sunday around 11.46 a.m. Her partner reported that his girlfriend may have fallen from the boat. The pair had gone to sleep at about 10 p.m. And the Coast Guard is getting their call at almost noon the following day. Definitely something we've seen in cases before where we've been suspicious of intimate partner uh, homicide in particular. But at 2 a.m., he woke up and realized that she was not on board. So we're starting to put together some type of timeline around this. They're out at dinner earlier that night. They get back to the boat, supposedly. I am seeing some mentions that they watched Netflix or some movie for a little bit. Uh, I think he kind of fell asleep during that. He's saying at 2 a.m. his boat alarm goes off, basically that his boat is dragging. It's it's moving too much from where it's supposed to be um, anchored. He gets up because of that alarm, and then he goes down to the bedroom, and she's not down there, and that's when he realizes she's not there. Now, some of the early reports on this, and honestly, some of the later reports, I, I'm not even sure where this really winds up. There's kind of two different versions of what happens at 2 a.m. Either it's he calls the local police and talks about that she's missing, telling them that. Um, but there's another story where he actually gets into his dinghy and drives over to the shoreline and talks to them in person. What Where the story kind of comes back together is either way, the police basically tell him, notify the Coast Guard. And that's at 2 a.m. And we don't have that notification for the Coast Guard happen for over nine hours after that. So that's that's one of those things in this case that's kind of an open lingering question that people are still wondering about. Uh, her family is certainly still wondering about her friends. It's one of the big questions um, that just there doesn't seem to be any reasonable answer for Sarm, who has previously worked as a flight attendant and in call centers, has been living in the area since the beginning of 2020. After finishing charter last Sunday, she went out for dinner in the evening before returning to the boat. Police Department Public Information Officer Toby Derima said, an English woman has gone missing on our island and we are appealing for help in trying to locate her. Every day that goes by and we don't have any news about her is a major concern for us. We need to locate her as soon as possible and especially with the pretense of there might have been some accident she might have fallen off the boat or something like that even by the time these articles are coming out we're talking days later um things aren't looking good if that's the reality of of what we're dealing with on this case continuing at crimeonline.com who by the way uh crime online sometimes will do coverage where they're effectively just doing rewrites of major points from other publications. But on certain cases, they really get going with their own investigative techniques. And this is one of those cases. So I want to call them out. We use Crime Online as a source here frequently because they're so good at consolidating information and really trying to stick to facts. Um, in this case, they kind of went next step on that. So I really want to, want to call them out. I appreciate um, the extra work that they really threw into this. but So according to the reports, the vessel's dinghy was still tied on the boat. Investigators have launched an intensive search for the woman and have found no sign of her despite favorable search conditions and visibility. Yeah, that's another aspect to this story where uh, we're talking about water that you could actually see into, pretty clear blue water. And even where their boat was moored, 
it was only somewhere between 11 and 14 feet deep there. Um, but of course that doesn't take out the possibility of tides pulling her out. It, I, I think it raises a bit of a question in terms of even if she, if her body had been pulled out by tides, wouldn't there have been some, some chance of her showing up on a shore or a piece of her clothing showing up on the shore at some point, you know, we've looked into the Salish uh, shoe mystery before, you know, some, some item of hers winding up somewhere. And we don't have that in this case. Uh, quote, we had a Coast Guard helicopter searching that afternoon and the search continued throughout the night, said spokesman Ricardo Castrodad. Um, he said that the conditions were excellent as far as visibility, sea state, and there were no signs of anyone in the water. Further, investigators have not found evidence that Heslop entered the water. Um, it's just certainly raising some questions about what, what's really going on with this case. Concerns are growing for a woman who vanished almost a week ago. Her friends have set up a missing Sarm Heslop Facebook page to share information about the search. As always, we'll have all the links down below the Facebook page, the main website they've put up, uh, also a podcast, really well done podcast called Missing. It's the first time I've run into this podcast. I think of it as almost like a UK version of Vanished. Um, highly recommend it for a follow-up to, to this video. Uh, Miss Mogridge Percy said, I'm feeling just pure shock, just sadness, just worry. It's a roller coaster of emotions. It's really hard to make sense of. She's a very smart, witty, sensible, fun person. She wouldn't have gone for a swim in the middle of the night. Um, yeah, keep in mind, this is someone that worked as a, a, an air attendant. This is someone that did that security check before every flight. This is someone that apparently is also a very good swimmer. If And we've, we've looked at the boat. I, I can't hit that point enough. If she was conscious in that water, she could have got to the back of that boat or she could have got in the dinghy or there's other boats that were moored around them. We're going to find out. Um, I think two in particular, she could have gone to either of those. If there was some other type of threat, like, you know, her boyfriend, like she didn't want to interact with him again or something had happened and she wound up in the water and she wasn't going to go back to him. There was possibilities in at, at play here. So it really raises the question of just what's going on with this. Uh, to her friend's point, it's just really hard to understand what's happening and where she is. She added, it's really important that no one stops searching for her. We just need them to keep searching. Kate Vernals, another friend, said, it's a desperate time at the moment whilst we all come together as friends in the UK to find SARM and try to get as much word out there as possible. Um, so this is actually a charter rental site and I wanted to come here because this is the actual boat. Um, and there's numerous pictures of the inside of it as well. Um, it's actually talking about how you can book this yacht. It's got pricing for it. I don't know why this is still active. I did find another site like this and it, the, it's been deactivated over on that site. Um, for some reason, this one is still active, but so let's just take a look at the interior really quick. Um, this is the front and I, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the catamaran, but usually they, they kind of have this scooped front like this. And there's these sections that are almost like big lounging areas where it's almost like a hammock. There's like a fabric. You can kind of see the shadow of it, of where it ties to the actual boat there. But there's usually two large sections like that up in the front, uh, for people to kind of lounge on. And admittedly, like if you had fallen off the edge at the front here, there's nothing that you could do to get back up there. Um, except swim to the back. I mean, you guys can see, I mean, this is, these are, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of rooms in this. And there's this person here. This, I, I don't believe that this is SARM because there's no tattoo. But we are going to bump into a picture of this guy. And uh, that is her boyfriend. He would be pretty soon named by the Daily Mail. American boyfriend, Ryan Bain, 44 years old. 
Mr. Bain said he was awoken by the sound of the boat's anchor alarm, which sounds when a vessel has moved too far from its mooring, before discovering his girlfriend was missing. A friend of Mr. Bain said, He's beside himself with grief and worry. He's heartbroken. I know from what he said that Ryan and Sarm were very much in love. Uh, and that's pretty much what we hear from her friends as well. This was a relationship that was going very seriously. Um, to the point that they decided that they were going to work together so that they could spend more time together. Chris Wilson, a longtime friend of Heslop's from the UK, told Crime Online that until the day of her disappearance, Heslop remained in regular contact with an extended group of friends. There were text conversations happening right up until Sunday, Wilson said, adding that he wasn't aware of anything out of the ordinary in those communications. Whatever she does, she is very sensible and maintains close contact with her friends. That's absolutely key to her. That's why it's a troubling situation that she's been out of touch for this long, Wilson said. And the boyfriend, Bain, does quickly get a lawyer. A lawyer for Bain told Fox News that the 44-year-old man is devastated about Heslop's disappearance. Quote, his only hope is that Sarm is found alive and well. His thoughts and prayers are with Sarm and her family during this difficult time, the lawyer said. So we now know who the boyfriend is. We kind of know the basics of the story that he's telling the authorities. I don't know about you guys, but I have a giant question in my head. Have they searched his boat? Have they, have they just taken a look? I mean, could there be obvious signs that maybe there was a struggle or something that had happened on there? Over at telegraph.co.uk, police say boat where Sarm Heslop was last seen will be searched eventually. Police in the U.S. Virgin Islands were criticized for failing to search the catamaran. A spokesperson for the USVI police department told the Telegraph, we have not been able to search the boat yet and we'll do this in due course. It's something that will be done eventually. He added that police are keeping their options open and are looking to see whether Ms. Heslop could have fled to St. Thomas, a 20-minute boat ride away from St. John's. And here we get to a sighting. A citizen had said that they had seen Ms. Heslop on the island on Thursday the 11th, so that's several days after, but they found no sign of her when they investigated. Since we've not been able to locate her on St. John's, we are looking into the possibility that she could be in St. Thomas, and the search will start over there soon. Um, I don't know why that would be prioritized over checking the boat. Like, I mean, just based on the odds that we know about... I mean, I understand this is not a homicide investigation at this point. This is a missing persons case. Uh, if we chase down how many missing persons cases do turn out to be um, cases where someone's deceased and we just don't know it yet, that's a pretty substantial number. If it does turn out to be a homicide, which is, once again, we're cutting that pie again a little bit, but if it does turn out to be a homicide, the likelihood that it's someone that she knew or someone that's close to her a very big piece of that pie as well. So it's just kind of weird to me that they're kind of like, eh, we haven't done it yet. We're going to get to it. But hey, we heard that she was on the island, but we went and looked and we couldn't find her on the island. So we're going to go. I mean, even the story that he's saying, he didn't come to them and say, hey, I assume she took off because we, you know, we had been arguing lately or I could tell she wasn't really into me or something. I think she just wanted to leave and she probably just fled and you know she's she's somewhere else or she's with someone else or something like that that's not even the story that he's giving them it's like if 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 the, he is a person that's trying to to lay down and um a smoke screen of some kind it's like the police are kind of helping him with the these types of spun out theories that we're seeing at this point where it just seems super simple like where was she last seen Go take a look there. I think it's fair to just apply some level of, of common sense to that line of thinking and saying, you know, it seems like checking the boat is probably a stronger move than we're going to go look at a neighboring island. It'd be something else if the dinghy was gone. Like if they noted, oh, by the way, the dinghy's missing, then yeah, then that possibility opens up. But that's not what we have here. Uh, a Facebook group, Missing Person, Sarm Heslop, has been set up by more than a dozen worried friends seeking answers. 
Um, she had a lot of people that, or has a lot of people that really, really care about her. It's obvious. The Facebook page is updated regularly. The website is updated regularly. Um, they're doing a really good job working together uh, to try to help keep the exposure raised on this case. And this is one of the steps they took, creating the Facebook group. Laura Taylor, 33, has told the Mirror that they hope to keep the pressure on the authorities and today revealed a potential lead. She said, we are aware that at 1 a.m. in the morning, between that 10 p.m. and 2 a.m. time frame, somebody who was walking their dogs came forward and said they heard a scream. He was walking his dogs and he heard a scream, heard a female scream. He heard it from the bay side. I don't know if the police have followed up on it. Uh, that seems like a big piece of information. Of course, it could play into multiple situations. If she had fallen into the water, that could elicit a scream. If something was happening on the boat, that could elicit a scream. It doesn't really help us in terms of understanding too much outside of potentially giving us a time frame where something might have happened. Um, quote, it's really important to note how close the boat is. A lot of people have been reporting that she's lost at sea. She's not. The boat is only about 120 feet from the shore. Yeah, that was something when I first started looking into this case as well, um, I was thinking, oh man, it's going to be one of those situations. We've, we've covered some cases like this in the past. They're out in the middle of the ocean. One of them comes back. The other one doesn't. You know, those are some of the toughest cases that we look at. It's not quite the same situation here. They're, they're moored 120 feet from the shore, other boats around them. Uh, which is also curious about this witness. And I I do have to say there's sometimes you will have information. I mean, just like the false sighting information that came in, right? The possibility that that was accurate, very, very, very low. But to the point that that information coming into the authorities pulled the investigation into a different direction. I worry about information like this. It's someone in the area. They're saying they were there at the time. I get all that. Um, you want that information to be put in play. You want the authorities to know about it so they could take steps and, and kind of act on it. But uh, this isn't an eyewitness account. You know, this is someone hears something and it could have been someone else. Like, you know, this is probably an area where maybe people are drinking, they're partying, maybe other couples, maybe they're having arguments. There's, there's possibilities that this might have not been a scream from SARM necessarily. People in general want to be helpful. I get that. And that's why we had what I do think is a false sighting. That's why we have this person step forward. I heard a scream. But those pieces have to be laid into a much bigger puzzle. Um, and it's, it's tough because we don't know, looking outside in as we do using the lens of media, which is exactly what we're doing here, that is giving us a very dis a very distinct view on this, a view that is heavily, heavily filtered. We don't have the actual police file in front of us. New information, possible witnesses. And this new information might clear up one of the misconceptions I had about this. Uh, we have his lawyer kind of giving Bain's version of the events. The lawyer, his name is David Caddy, said Bain contacted the Virgin Islands Police Department by phone at 2.30 a.m. Quote, in addition to making that call, Mr. Bain then met members of the VIPD on shore in St. John. So it seems like both happened. He did contact them by phone, then got in the dinghy, went to the shore to meet them. I'm curious why it happened in that direction. Um, wouldn't it make sense? Like if, if he thought that she had fallen into the water, um, why is he going to leave the boat? And, and, you know, we're talking within hours like this might have, if that scream is accurate, this is an hour later. What if there was some accident that had happened? He leaves the boat and goes to shore. Wouldn't you stay on the boat and tell VIPD, you guys should get out here and, you know, bring some lights, bring some other dinghies. Let's like start the search. It's an interesting choice. Um, so he goes to meet them on the shore. Mr. Bain gave VIPD a statement and provided a photograph of SARM to the officers. It does not appear that VIPD officers access Siren Song during that first meeting with Bain about Heslop's disappearance as Bain took his dinghy to meet them at a dock. It's a very curious choice. And even like, I'm going to take a photograph over there. 
I really, would you have that type of forethought? Like you, you've just made this discovery about her being missing and like, oh, here, they're going to need a photograph. I don't think I would be in a mindset where I would be thinking that clearly and be able to make choices like that. And, and I talk about these cases as my job. And I, I still don't think if I was, if it was someone that I love that had just gone missing like that, I'm pretty sure I, I would have to be prompted for, oh, do you have any photos of her? We're going to need something. Um, maybe they did prompt it during the phone call. Caddy also said that the Coast Guard officers searched the vessel later that day. So Caddy is saying initially, Coast Guard did search the vessel at Bain's request. A spokesperson for the U.S. Coast Guard was not immediately able to provide confirmation or further details of that search. And that's for good reason, because there was no search. The spokesperson confirmed that the Coast Guard searched the water in the area where Heslop went missing for several hours on March 8th using air and surface assets. The search concluded with no sign of the missing woman. So the Coast Guard did actually come out to his vessel. And basically, the gist of what happened based on numerous articles that I've read on it is um, they asked, can we take a look at the rooms inside? And he said no. And I think in one, the way it was described in one particular article, he actually blocked them. He, he stood in their way. Um, they wound up citing him for a couple of safety violations and for denying them the search. Apparently, there are laws about um, what you're able to, to do if there's been an accident. Like, I think that would trigger some type of investigation. Um, or ability for there to be an investigation. And he was basically impeding that. So he did get these kind of, unfortunately, minor citations. But I'm also curious that they didn't have any escalation path just based off that. You know, like, oh, he denied a search. We cited him for some safety concerns. I think he was also missing or didn't have his paperwork on hand. Something, something along those lines. They were kind of just getting some technicalities in place, which... You might have law enforcement do as a means of getting access so that they could look around. Oh, look, there's some blood over here. And then that would lead them into the probable cause for the next thing. It, it, but this is also Coast Guard. This isn't, um, you know, like I'm, I'm thinking like a detective or a cop and like what their mentality would be. I think the Coast Guard is going to act a little bit different in that regard. But the Coast Guard did what the Coast Guard does. They did search the water. Unfortunately, um, there were no signs at all, which still boggles my mind, especially if you're thinking accidental situation like, you know, was she wearing clothes? Was she wearing shoes? Where is all that stuff? Possible witnesses come forward or try to. CrimeCon Online has learned that a group of vacationing friends were moored in Frank Bay at the time Heslop disappeared. David Woody and his wife, Victoria Hastings, were among that group. Woody said that their boat was about 100 feet from where Bain's catamaran was moored. So we have another boat only 100 feet away. Even if you didn't want to get back on that boat because something was going on, you didn't want to try swimming to the coast because of the danger of that, there was another boat 100 feet away. Some members of Woody's group saw the couple relaxing on the boat Sunday afternoon and early evening and nothing appeared out of the ordinary, Woody said. The group of friends all went to bed around 10 p.m. None heard any unusual noises or commotion overnight. Woody said he saw Siren Song the next morning in the same spot where it had been the day before. He said he noticed the dinghy was still on the boat, and he did not see Bain or Heslop that morning. He shared a photo of the two catamarans with Siren Song, the one being on the left, taken from a fishing boat. They had done a fishing excursion that day. Um, so you can see how close these boats are to each other. You can see how close the boats are to the shoreline as well. Home right here, there's a possibility that home uh, could have a dock. We can't see enough of it, but I would be very surprised if the homes that weren't right on the water didn't have some form of uh, way to relax down by the water, uh, even just a little, uh, you know, like a little wooden jetty of some kind or something like that. Woody did not learn until late Tuesday, March 9th, that anyone had gone missing, and he said that he was surprised Bain did not attempt to contact him after Haslop vanished from the boat. That's kind of weird. Um, because, especially if you're worried that she fell over, 
Aren't you going to look for other places where she might have gotten to to try to be helped? And that other one's a catamaran too. Same thing with the back end in terms of it having steps. Like it's very reasonable that if she had some accident and fell in the water um, and she needed help, like at a minimum, what if, what if they, because think about it from his story, he's sleeping, he's, he's knocked out for the night. He wakes up, he notices she's not there. The dinghy's still there and she's not. Could there have been an accident in that time where you were sleeping and someone else actually took care of the situation for you? Maybe they were coming back from the shore. Maybe they pulled her up, brought her back to their boat, something like, wouldn't it have just been, wouldn't you have at least checked with them? Now on the flip side, their information also isn't really, really pushing, uh, or I mean, it doesn't really omit the possibility, but it's really not supporting any type of like, Hey, we heard that there was a vicious argument going on over there. We had heard some weird noises, something breaking. They also don't have that type of information. Admittedly, um, I don't know how much sound is going to get out. Like you saw all the rooms in that thing. Like if you were downstairs in the belly of that, I'm not sure how sound travels from down there, but um, it's weird. Their information's kind of lighten up both sides for me. You know, he's not really asking them, have they seen her or even to make them aware like, what if this at this point is a recovery effort? What if we're just trying to bring her remains home? Wouldn't you at least, like, they're they're out there a couple days. Wouldn't you at least tell them, hey, by the way, my girlfriend's missing. If you guys see anything, please let us know. On that Tuesday evening, after Woody's group had moved on to another bay in St. John's, their bay host told them that the locals had been trying to track them down. Woody said that he then spoke on the phone to a woman who said she was a friend of Heslop's and Bain's. Shortly after they hung up, Bain unexpectedly called Woody. During that brief conversation, Woody says that Bain advised him to give a statement to police and give him a VIPD detective and gave him a VIPD detective's contact information. Um, interesting, because I'm wondering what that conversation was like. I'm wondering, did Bain ask Woody about what he heard and saw? And then after hearing that was like, oh, okay, well, hey, contact the police and give him a statement, would you? Like, did he check him for information is what I'm wondering. Woody says he called that detective who said that they were busy with another case at that time, but he would follow up within a day. The detective never called him back, Woody said. Um, yeah, it's really troubling with how long, and you guys know I'm always, I want to uh, sing the praises when law enforcement's doing a good job, but we also have to wave the flag when we see something else going on. And in this case, it just, it's, it's perplexing. The choices that are being made, the lack of responsiveness is, it's troubling. Parents of Brit, 41, missing for 12 days in Caribbean, distraught by disappearance. In a statement, her parents, Peter Heslop and Brenda Street, said, We are shocked and distraught that Sarm is missing. We would like assurance that the authorities in the Virgin Islands are doing everything possible to find her and that the investigation into our beautiful and cherished daughter's disappearance includes a comprehensive fingertip search of the boat. Our daughter is a UK citizen and we ask for all the support that the UK authorities have to offer. Um, basically, it seems like those attempts have not been very strong for them. Our thanks go to the local people of St. John's Island who continue to search for Sarm. We will never give up looking for Sarm, and we still have hope of finding her safe. It is understood investigators from the VIPD are now in possession of Ms. Heslop's belongings, but have yet to search the yacht. Still. I believe they are actually still, as of today, uh, they, they're still in possession of her belongings. I think like a tablet, cell phone, her personal items. Her family has asked for that stuff back. They're not giving it back. They're saying active investigation, which any type of digi digital foren forensics that are going to be done have been done at this point. At a minimum, the data has been pulled off those devices into some type of backup. Um, I don't know why those items can't be returned to the family so they could have their team proce or, um, process those items. Boyfriend won't let cops search boat. Uh, Virgin Islands police now say that Bain lawyered up and has not allowed them to search the boat since Heslop went missing nearly two weeks ago. Soon after reporting this, and honestly, there's a little lesson in this. Um, because once he gets a lawyer, 
you know that that is going to kind of be off the table. That initial search should have happened really, really soon. And especially knowing what happened with the Coast Guard going out there and them being stopped from going into the rooms. Shouldn't that be a form of probable cause in itself or at least, or at least a minimum be a point that VIPD kind of goes back and they're like, we heard that you wouldn't let the Coast Guard in and they actually winded up citing you for that. Can we talk a little bit more about this? It, it just, it seems to me that the opportunity for trying to get into the boat um, would have been much stronger early on in, I think in any case, but a, a case of this nature in particular. And uh, keep in mind, this is a guy with means. I've, I've seen him described as a millionaire in some places. Apparently the attorney that he got is some kind of high powered attorney as well. Um, so it's weird that, you know, oh, a couple of weeks later, we're hearing that you guys can't get into the boat. It's kind of like, well, yeah, what would you have expected? And even that raises the question of like, is this what they expected? Is this kind of how they want this to go? Do they have some reason that they don't want this case to be fully prosecuted? Um, and there is some question of that. I know uh, some of the comments I've seen from the family and friends is just wondering about like, is this, we need to protect the tourism community here at all costs because it it is what's keeping this place going. Um, something I can't quite shake completely, especially seeing these choices that have been made time and time again around this case. Um, so yeah, soon after reporting Ms. Heslop missing, Mr. Bain acquired the services of an attorney, a spokesperson for the police department said. Upon his attorney's advice, Mr. Bain exercised his constitutional right to remain silent and denied officers' requests to search the vessel. Uh, the Miranda rights that we covered earlier this week on the channel. The U.S. Coast Guard came to Mr. Bain's vessel, Siren Song, at Mr. Bain's request, his lawyer said in a statement. Multiple USCG, the Coast Guard, officers boarded the vessel and interviewed Mr. Bain on the vessel. Uh, the lawyer keeps bringing this up, almost trying to you know, paint the picture that, hey, he was open, they were on... They were on the vessel. They would have noticed anything weird. And that's not how it went down, according to the other information that's out there. Um, yes, they were on the vessel. They were not allowed to look in those rooms at all. They basically met up on the top deck, and that was all they saw. The Virgin Islands Police Department said it's continuing the search for Haslop, including conducting multiple searches daily and going through hours of surveillance video that may shed light on her disappearance. Um, that's interesting because we know part of the story is them being on shore, going to dinner there. So there should be some footage from that. And could there be something in that footage that's telling? And, you know, is there some type of disagreement they were having at the dinner table or something along those lines? Sarm Heslop's boyfriend has previous domestic violence arrest. So his ex-wife starts coming forward and talking about issues in their marriage. And one of those included um, some violence that had happened that resulted in him spending some days in jail. Corey Stevenson, the former wife of Heslop's boyfriend, Ryan Bain, said that Bain's demeanor toward her changed almost immediately after their wedding and that she cut their honeymoon short because she was concerned for her safety. After years of a difficult and allegedly abusive marriage, Stevenson divorced Bain in 2014. Crime Online obtained a copy of the 2011 arrest report charging Bain with simple assault against his then wife. Stevenson provided screenshots of her email correspondence with the VIPD, alerting them to her concerns about Bain. So uh, she's saying that there's a possibility something else is at play here. She's trying to let that police department know about it. And, uh, you know, with how they're processing information. I mean, I who knows? Who knows if that really affected the investigation at all? Um, some more details about what happened in that 2011 domestic violence arrest. Uh, according to partially redacted police reports, uh, officers responded to a home in Orion Township, Michigan, in the early morning hours of November 27, 2011. Uh, Crime Online confirms that it, the victim was his ex-wife, Corey. Both Bain and Stevenson told police that they had gotten into a verbal argument on the drive home from a wedding, and Stevenson, who was driving, said that Bain became angry because she was asking for directions. She claimed that Bain dragged her out of the car when they arrived home. Once inside their home, he allegedly grabbed her in the dining room, threw her to the ground, 
then smashed her head into the floor, chipping one of her teeth. Police found Stevenson with a chipped tooth that appeared to be fresh. Her right earlobe was bloody and scratched. Her right shoulder and the right side of her neck showed red scratches. Her right eyelid was scratched and red. In an interview with police, Bain accused Stevenson of attacking him. The report indicates that some details provided by Bain were not supported by physical evidence at the scene. So it sounds like basically he's like, no, she's the one that started this whole attack. But effectively, the police are saying the information was not there to support his claims. So even with him lawyered up, what about the possibility of just getting a warrant? Like how much probable cause would you have to pull together in a case like this? Uh, we know that a significant search effort was mounted. We know about the gap in time in terms of him reporting it to the Coast Guard, which let's be honest, like VIPD, what kind of search are they going to do? Maybe they have a boat or two that they would be able to get out there. I could see if you were trying to get away with a crime, this is all theoretical, um, that making that next step and calling a resource like the Coast Guard would be intimidating because they're going to have legit skills and equipment to be able to do that type of search. Regardless, we have these parts in the story that are really hard to understand based on his actions and what he's telling VIPD. Isn't that enough to get a judge to sign a warrant and get that access that you need to the boat to see if that's really a possibility? Virgin Islands police spokesman Toby Darima added, we would need to get a warrant to search the boat. We would need to show the court that we had probable cause to search the boat, as this is not yet a criminal case. I understand all that, and I'm sure it's going to be a challenge, but it sounds like there's a couple pieces at play that should help with that. We thought we could just ask Mr. Bain to search the boat, and he would say yes, and he didn't. That's his right. Getting the search warrant would be the next step. However, we're still searching, doing regular inspections of the areas, and speaking to potential witnesses. Uh, you know, that might be helpful in terms of them looking at CCTV footage, if they could, again, prove that there was some type of disagreement that happened earlier that night. Talking to witnesses, if there was people at the restaurant that saw some type of disagreement, that could be helpful, I think, in terms of getting this warrant. And we get some information from another friend of theirs, uh, Flora Pickard, a chef who has known the couple since they first met sailing in Granada last year said Mr. Bain had been a total mess since Ms. Heslop went missing and could remember little of the night she disappeared. Ms. Pickard told the Telegraph, he can't even speak. He's like, so, so sad. The worst part for him is he really doesn't remember because they were completely drunk. He's like, all I know is I woke up and she's not there. She added, Ryan couldn't handle drink as well as she could, so he would quite often pass out first. And then she just carried on. Uh, anytime I hear of like a uh, someone claiming to have like a blackout of consciousness, especially if we're talking about it on this channel, because we are talking about things that more often than not turn out turn out to be criminal, um, that's always concerning for me. And the other thing is, if there's variations in stories, you might say that, well, maybe he's remembering the major parts, but that's it. And he's just saying he was so drunk, he can't remember anything else around those major parts. So this isn't exactly like he's telling one person this, he's telling one person something completely different. I think there's a truth that could be in between, you know, these two different, somewhat different versions of, of the story that he's told. Um, but it is, it is kind of interesting to know that at least according to this friend, alcohol is a component of this evening and to a point where it's in excess, like he's he's not necessarily aware of everything that happened. This being the U.S. Virgin Islands, the FBI does get involved um, and they, they start assisting with this case as well. And then we start getting a little more detail in terms of where they were earlier that night. The manager of the restaurant, 420 to Center, told the Post that the FBI has not shown up at the eatery, but said that the VIPD interviewed staffers who were on duty the night that the couple was there. The police came to the restaurant and questioned the two folks who worked, who worked that night. Uh, it seemed as though they had been drinking and whatnot, and then they left, she said. They were just regular customers. Nothing seemed out of the ordinary. The bartender recognized the gentleman, not the young lady. So it, it does seem like VIPD is looking for that piece they need to try to firm up that warrant, and maybe they're just not finding it. We then have 
the boyfriend and his catamaran disappear. Police don't know where Ryan Bain is. Uh, we have the FBI actually hunt for him. They chart their own boat to go find him. And really, the wrap-up to this is it seems like they identify where he is, but I think they realize at this point the press has just been pounding this story. People are probably looking at this guy sideways, and they kind of start being reserved about where he actually is. But effectively, it's like they're, they're keeping tabs on him. Uh, there is a, a warning that comes from the locals, though, that if he basically took off and he was headed for nearby Dutch, British, or French territories, that it might be impossible for authorities to extradite him. So there was a bit of risk when all of a sudden he goes taking off because uh, that might have been the move. That might have been him going on the run. I don't think that's really not how it, it played out. And now we know he's back here in the U.S., so he's, he's certainly not on the run. But coming up on about three weeks since her disappearance, we get this report from The Telegraph. Police question whether missing British woman actually boarded boyfriend's boat. It's an interesting theory um, because what if something happened on land or on the dinghy? Uh, that would that would kind of change the scope a little bit. It would also change the importance of actually uh, doing an investigation on the, the catamaran. But um, detectives are scouring CCTV video from locations around the island of St. John in an attempt to establish if Sarm Heslop can be seen returning to Ryan Bain's luxury yacht. Uh, Toby Darima, again, the spokesperson, said nothing so far actually confirms that the couple went back to the yacht together that night. That's why we're looking through the surveillance video to establish if there is evidence of them going back to the vessel. Of course, we know what he says happened, and he does say that th they went back. Obviously, we know the dinghy did go back to the yacht, but it has not so far been verified that Sarm was on it, says law enforcement. Fox News swung in an expert to comment on this case. Jerry Forrester is a former FBI agent and private investigator who has worked extensively in the Caribbean. He said that it seemed not normal that local police had not searched Bain's boat. Get a warrant. Seriously, get a warrant. Get a judge to sign the warrant and get a search warrant, Forrester said. They have enough probable cause, I think. She's missing. And she was on that boat. They're just not doing their job. And it makes me wonder if that's why this article came out about them saying, oh, we don't know if she was even on the boat, ever on the boat. Or is that what they're hearing from the judge? Is the judge actually pushing back on them saying, we don't know that she was on the boat, so I can't give you guys that that search warrant. We need confirmation that she was actually on the boat. Because um, that seems to be all that this expert thinks is needed. Basically, if they could just prove that she was on the boat and she is missing, we know she is missing, that should be enough to get it. The easily accessible water can be linked to many disappearances where victims may have drowned accidentally, been injured or killed by forces of nature, Forrester said. There's so many things that can happen to you. I just don't believe that all the people who are missing are missing because they all got killed. But foul play does happen. Um, so yeah, I think he's trying to stay open to the other possibilities in this case as well. It's just tough when I, I just can't imagine the accident that would happen here. It's just, there's, there's not enough height. There's not enough, like, I just, I can't imagine what type of big danger would have happened, um, that would have prevented her from just swimming around to the back and just being right back on the boat. Now, it would certainly be helpful if they could prove that she did make it back to the boat, but then we hit something here. Final movements not caught on bar CCTV due to power failure. I read about camera problems so often in these cases, it's, it's mind-blowing. Um, bar owner Ryan Sharkey said the CCTV was blown out a few days before by an electrical outage. I've only just got it replaced. We just don't have footage of them. Police were disappointed when I told them. She and Ryan were at the edge of the bar. No arguing, no trouble, not that we know about. They were talking. That was it. It was about 6 p.m. or 7 p.m. when they came in. I think he had three beers and Sarm no more than two. They were here for about an hour and a half. Um, so the timing is 
lining up there there's a little gap in time there it's making me wonder if actually they could have gone somewhere else if they show up there at some point between six and seven and they're only there for about an hour and a half that means they're leaving at 8 30 at the latest um his story really doesn't pick up until about 10 o'clock that they're back at the boat so there's a possibility that maybe maybe there's another location here that we just don't know about but yeah no no footage from this bar supposedly uh police searching for missing brit sarm heslop cannot find her u.s boat skipper lover ryan bain cops have issued a new appeal to bain so they found him they were kind of keeping tabs on him he went missing again spokesman toby Darima said i appeal to him now to contact us i want to appeal to his conscience to let us know what happened the night sarm disappeared He's a person of interest to us, and he is the only person of interest. We're not looking for anyone else. So that is finally some form of strong wording in terms of their considerations with him. Um, but at this point, they don't know where he is. His attorney responds, I can state that I personally advise law enforcement of Mr. Bain's movements while in the territory and about his departure from the U.S. Virgin Islands. I further advise law enforcement that if Mr. Bain's presence is legally required in the territory, he will return upon such a demand. So his lawyer is saying, yeah, he left. He left, and you guys don't need to know where he is, but if you want him back, just notify us and he'll be there. Police say they were denied search warrant. We kind of knew that this was, was going to be tough at some point, but uh, here's the confirmation. They are saying they did try to get more than one search warrant, but the court basically denied them each time. However, experts say it's unusual for investigators to fail to obtain a search warrant in this situation. In fact, it should have been one of the first steps along with interviewing witnesses and reviewing video, according to David Katz, a former senior special agent with the DEA. I may, it may not even center on Bain. She went missing from the boat. I want to search the boat and find out, was there something? Maybe there was someone else on that boat. Someone snuck on the boat um true like th there's other possibilities that could happen there and i think he's once again drawing that point about the search warrant isn't even necessarily about bane it's just they need to get to the location where she was last known to be but i think that's why we saw that run of articles i think the judges are basically pushing back and saying look we don't know you guys don't really have a statement from bane that's solid and uh you know, we, we just, we can't confirm that she was actually there when she went missing. If all this isn't tough enough and hard to understand, in October of 2021, someone decides to sell their boat. Yacht where missing Brit was staying for sale with names scrubbed off. The catamaran siren song is being sold for 220,000 pounds. Bain, 44 years old, is selling the Leopard 47 through a broker on the Caribbean island of Granada where he lives. So it sounds like he's back. I don't know. This guy's coming and going. It's hard to keep track of where he is. The ad makes no mention of its role in her disappearance, of course. Yeah, I think that's part of them wanting to remove the name from it. It says the sale is due to the owner having moved on to land. So maybe he did leave. Maybe he's just selling this thing remotely. He wouldn't have to be there for that, I, I guess. At one point, the boat was renamed to Orion's Belt. I think that's before it was sold. Um, but the team that's working with the family now is saying that they can't really confirm if it has been sold. They assume that it has been sold. It's weird because I would think that records like that might be traceable, but maybe they're not. Maybe they're kept private. Um, the, the team working with the family now also wishes that they could get a forensic search done of the boat even three years later because maybe there's something in there that could be helpful to them um, and they've got some good reasons to think that there's a possibility of that but before we get to that remember how we were talking about there being no cctv footage of that last night there is just another bizarre twist in this caribbean island police criticized over cctv a year after she vanished, her parents met with police where they were shown footage of the couple leaving a bar. They say the clothes their daughter was wearing in the video 
did not match those reported by Mr. Bain, which is honestly, it's interesting because I actually haven't seen a clothing description, at least that that made the media rounds. In the CCTV, Ms. Heslop is seen wearing either a skirt or shorts and a top, the BBC was told. Uh, her boyfriend, Ryan Bain, told police and Sarm's parents and friends that she was wearing a black dress with flowers on. There was not a black dress with flowers in her belongings when those were returned to her parents some months after her disappearance, her friends added. They have repeatedly asked the island's police for a copy of the CCTV footage so they could release it to the media, but the USVI police have declined to provide this, stating that it would jeopardize the ongoing investigation. Why would police not release the CCTV footage of SARM's last movements, they said. Um, at least a still shot. That's really unbelievable. And there's another twist in this. Um, apparently, when it was being shown to the family, they said that they could see both of them come into frame. I think they're heading down a dock. And then one of the law enforcement officers that was showing them this footage runs up and stops the tape before they're out of frame and before it hits the end. And they're just wondering, like, what are they stopping us from seeing? What else was was on there? Of course, they don't have a copy of it. Um, and we're hearing publicly that it must not be from that bar or we have the owner of the bar lying for some reason. Why would that be? I have no idea. Maybe there was another stop. Maybe there was another bar after that. And that information just hasn't been released publicly. It's really difficult and tricky to try to, to figure all that out. Um, there's also the possibility that the footage does show something that actually proves that they got in the dinghy together because that's the way the family describes it. That's kind of where the, the tape got stopped is as they were going to where their dinghy was. Um, if, if the family knew that they actually did have footage of them getting in the dinghy together, it could be at that point that they would ask BIPD, well, didn't you guys tell the judge this? Because... Uh, we now have them in the same vessel together, leaving the dock, and we know she goes missing. Couldn't that help in terms of this warrant that we can't seem to get? Um, so it's interesting just to think about why you're going to show something to a family like that and then stop the, the tape uh, kind of in the middle of the moment like that. This is just the case that has recording issues all over it. We now learn of an issue that happened with the Coast Guard's recording system. Their recording system failed. Why is that important? Well, because uh, they received the call from him, admittedly nine hours after he had spoken to VIPD. But if what if this did go to a trial? What if there was some information in that call that could have been helpful? It's gone. We do not have a recording of the call to the Coast Guard. Our digital voice recording equipment is typically designed to save content for at least 30 days, and then it either deletes or overwrites with new memory after 90. However, I learned that the system in use at that time was faulty and did not record the call. That system has since been upgraded, and despite the voice recording not being available for me to provide, the lack of recording in real time would not have affected the Coast Guard's ability to respond to the initial report, which I get, and again... That's why we have to kind of keep that line in our mind about this is the Coast Guard. This is not necessarily a law enforcement division. They're not thinking, they're not worried about some prosecution that could happen years and years later. They basically were taking a call. They had to get their search services out and they were able to do that with the equipment that they had. I get that. It's just in light of what else could be happening in this case, you would like to think that calls that important would be recorded. And even if their equipment was working right, it would have been. But here we go, more, more faulty equipment. Here is a picture of Sarm with her mother, Brenda Street, and this is coming up on the three-year anniversary. This article is from March of 2024. Speaking ahead of the third anniversary, Brenda Street says she believes the police probe in the Caribbean has been hampered by corruption and desperate attempts to protect tourism. She says, I don't believe Sarm just went missing. I believe she was murdered. I want justice for her. I want to bring her home so I know where she is. She deserves that. Brenda reveals that detectives have refused to speak to her or Sarm's father, Peter, for more than a year, despite their repeated pleas. So it sounds like the family has lost hope. The friends are also dealing with that reality as well. And we have 
someone appear back in the U.S., Bane winds up back in the U.S. and basically the parents are asking, you know, like, question this guy. You know, at least get him in for questioning. Here we have uh, a picture of him, a pretty recent picture of him at the gym. Brenda Street and Peter Heslop spoke out after Mr. Bain was spotted using a gym in his native Michigan, where he's reappeared after maintaining a low profile since their daughter vanished. Yeah, uh, I believe that it was family members of his ex-wife that basically snapped these photos, and I think they're trying to let people know where he is. Mr. Bain was photographed at the Planet Fitness in Lake Orion by someone with knowledge of the case. A family spokesman said, it's unimaginable that the police have never properly questioned Bain. Bain is the only person that knows what really happened that night. Sarm is not coming back, and the police need to start looking at reclassifying the case from missing person to murder. It's conceivable that the last person to see Sarm alive is just getting on with his life whilst we continue to live with the torment of her disappearance. Coast Guard officials said that when they visited his boat during a search and rescue operation that afternoon, they found him drunk and uncooperative. So we're getting some more details even on that interaction. Mr. Bain refused to answer questions and physically prevented them from searching his boat, leading to his receiving a citation for impeding officers. Would there have been a reason for him to stop them from searching? Possibly. Uh, an investigator that's helping the family now learned that Bain replaced the yacht freezer just soon after Sarm vanished. Ryan Bain sailed to Granada, replaced the freezer and other parts of his yacht, and then allegedly sold the boat, a private investigator told the New York Post. David Johnston, a former police officer working with Heslop's family, said the new details point to foul play, with Bain as the chief suspect. Sarm likely is dead, and her death was ultimately and could have been a murder. Even though law enforcement is not talking to the family directly, a local news source, Loop News, reached out to them for an update. USVI Police Department says Sarm Heslop case now before Attorney General. That sounds like movement. Following a request for information about new developments in the case, they responded, quote, there is no further development in this investigation and it has been referred to the Attorney General's office, a spokesperson replied in an email. Uh, what's interesting about that? The family has no idea what that means and they've had their people reach out to try to get some information from the police. The police is just not talking to them. Uh, so is this a helpful step? The way this is phrased, I don't think so. This sounds to me like they're basically packaging up everything that they have from the investigation. They haven't really added much to it. And they're basically dropping that off with the attorney general. And like what, what would happen from there? I have no idea. Um, maybe the attorney general's office would look at it, decide to assign their own investigator. Maybe it would get a fresh run under that. So there's a chance that there's a good development. Um, but I don't know. It could be that they review it and they're like, okay, there's nothing we can do with this. Uh, and what about Bain? The boyfriend told friends he can't do the boating thing anymore and he's taken to the skies to be a pilot, according to his ex-wife. There are so many things about this case that are disturbing. The way that it's being handled by the authorities um, the mechanism by which Bain has just been kind of protected throughout all this. And I'm still open to the possibility that there's something else going on here that he was not a part of. But outside of all that, I just can't figure out like how is there not some form of search that's been done on the boat? And even the sale of it, like if, if you sell real estate, you have to disclose what has happened there. Wasn't there something in terms of the sale of that boat where he had to do the same? Like you're still in a U.S. territory. You're still subject to laws of the United States. Do the new owners know about this case? I mean, the other possibility, the thing I was thinking was, you know, he was essentially renting that boat before. Could the new owners be doing the same? Is there a possibility that SARM's team could effectively find out who those new owners are and then rent the boat? Or, or make some arrangement with them for a forensic investigation to be done. Even that, I get, would be a Hail Mary. Because you would have to find something in that boat that would essentially prove that, you know, there was some form of violence there and that the form of violence 
um, could have been fatal. Like they would have to find a severe blood stain that was a huge amount, something along those lines. It wouldn't be enough to find traces of her DNA. She was living on the boat. Uh, I don't even know if it would be enough to find pieces of the boat that were damaged or that might show that there was some type of a fight that had happened on the boat. Um, because the chain of custody, the time that has lapsed, like I don't, I just don't think that would be super, super helpful. So I know it's a Hail Mary, but um it's still a chance. So I can understand why, why SARM's team is, is kind of trying to make some form of that happen. I just, I don't know what those steps look like in terms of trying to track down a boat. Is it possible? Do you guys have any experience with that? Please talk about it in the comments down below and let us know. Cause I've just, I've never hit a case where that's been an aspect of it. Like we need to find a boat. Um, in the description box down below, we have numerous links, of course, uh, I will include the link to findsarm.com, uh, the Facebook page, and the podcast that I mentioned as well, The Missing. I'll have the episode, that particular episode, in the description box down below. And we do have a interview that was done with Sky News. This is posted to the Facebook group on March 22nd of this year. A quote from her mother, Brenda. I do believe she was murdered. There are places where people can be put in the ocean and never be found. I believe that's what happened. I'd just like to bring her home. I can grieve then. I haven't grieved because I don't have her and I don't know how to. If you have friends that you think can be helpful with this case, please share this episode with them. Let's keep this exposure raised. And like I mentioned, if you're looking up, if you're looking for a follow-up to this segment, I believe that the missing episode on this case is excellent. I think you guys will really appreciate it. Uh, there's a lot of information from Brenda in that that I think you would appreciate. So please check that out. Take care, everyone. Stay safe. Have a great weekend. And please join us again next week right here on the Lord and Arts channel.